So in this section of the lecture, we're going to be talking about the other drugs that are available. So the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors and the entry inhibitors. Uh, it's important to note that these will not be on the exam. So if you're pressed for time, this is not a video that you need to watch. But for those who are interested in getting the full picture, I did want to provide this information so that it was available. Like I said, this is not going to be testable material, at least not this year. Um, but for people who are interested in working with marginalized populations or stigmatized people, or for those who are interested in learning more about the complete options for HIV, this is uh, made for you. And like I said before, a lot of this information does show up on licen licensing exams, so it might be worth taking a look at some point after you have more time. So as a rule or as a class, the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors all have uh, class effects, including rash and hepatotoxicity. The liver toxicity and rash usually occur within the first six weeks of starting a medication, but uh, as a benefit or as a, a general rule, one of the concerns is, well, how many people are going to stop taking this medication? And only about 5% will stop the medication because of these toxicities. Um, most often, the rash does go away. If it doesn't, you can treat through it with a topical corticosteroid or sometimes even a prednisone taper. Um, but in most cases, Neither of these is enough that it's going to cause the adverse events and cause patients to stop. Two of the drugs we're going to talk about, ropivirine and efavirenz, do have or do cause neuropsychiatric effects, much like the integrase inhibitors. Um, these are much more likely to cause neuropsychiatric effects than the integrase inhibitors are. They also have a number of drug interactions. And as examples, uh, efavirenz, nivirapine, and etravirine are CYP3A inducers. And I noticed that that does say inhibitors, and since I'm just noticing it, I do want to make sure you're aware that is supposed to be inducers. Um, Ropivirine is a substrate of 3A, so there is going to be some concern about drug interactions there. And many of the drugs in this class do have incredibly long half-lives, which means you can take them once a day and not have any concern. The first drug we're going to talk about is nivirapine. This is an inducer and a substrate of CYP3A. One of the reasons I bring this one up is because it does have some pretty interesting dosing. Um, again, this isn't going to be on the exam, but when you dose nivirapine, you usually are going to start with 200 milligrams once a day for two weeks. During that time, your body gets used to having the medication in its system. It will actually induce its own metabolism. And then at the end of two weeks, if there are no side effects that are worth stopping the medication, um, the dose goes up to four, 200 milligrams twice a day. There is an XR formulation of this medication, which would allow for 400 milligrams once a day. But if you do start a patient on that medication, you still need to start with two weeks of the 200 milligrams of the immediate release. And the company makes a, a lead-in package so that you can get all of that with one prescription. Uh, there are some guidelines when it comes to the CD4 count. You don't initiate this medication in women who have a CD4 count of greater than 250. And in men, you don't initiate it with CD4 counts of greater than 400. A question that always comes up is, well, what if you start it at a lower CD4 count and it goes above those numbers? That's completely fine. We would actually expect that the CD4 count does go up. So we do want to make sure that uh, if it does go higher, that's a good thing. We're going to keep them on the medicine at that point. Again, side effects are the, the rash and liver toxicities most often in the first six weeks. Uh, this one doesn't have neuropsychiatric effects. And whereas the efavirenz can cause triglyceride increases, this one has neutral effects in that it doesn't cause issues with the um, elevation of LDL or triglycerides. Efavirenz is unique in that it has a number of central nervous system effects. Um, these will include um, impaired con um, concentration, um, an inability to, um, to really focus on the work that they're doing. Um, this one also causes a drugged or a kind of high feeling, and people who have taken this medication the first couple of days that they take it especially feel like they are um, dealing with being drunk or have taken a substance that they maybe aren't used to taking. Um, this can also cause some issues with pretty vivid dreams. Um, some of the dreams are scary enough that uh, we've had people who have never dreamed in color are now waking up thinking that uh, they're checking their hands because they are certain that they've just killed somebody and there's, there should be blood all over their hands. Um, so why do we dose it at nighttime if there are side effects related to uh, the central nervous system? Um, the idea is that we are sleeping through most of those, those side effects. Um, this is particularly important um, when we're talking about the, the fact that if we were to take it during the day, um, people who needed to concentrate on their jobs 
um, including pharmacy students, would not necessarily be able to, uh, to tolerate a drug that impairs their concentration. And I do want to make sure that we are on the same page about the difference between nightly and at bedtime. Um, generally speaking, nightly means you're taking it after the sun goes down. At bedtime could be any time that a person goes to bed. And why that matters is that there are people, including nurses, who work the night shift. And if you tell them to take it at night, that could mean they take it before they go to work because they're working at night, or that could mean they're taking it before they go to bed in the morning. And it should be bedtime because we do want them to sleep through those side effects. Uh, we don't want to use this if we're trying to become pregnant because this does cause neural tube defects and facial clefts, most particularly in the, third, in the first trimester. Uh, this can cause false positive cannabinoid exams, urine toxins, uh, but anecdotally, it's also caused some issues with methadone and benzodiazepines in the past, at least in our clinic. Um, what you want to do is make sure that uh, the member who or the patient who has the, the positive cannabinoid test is given a second test from a different manufacturer to test and make sure that that isn't a true positive. Um, this is actually concerning in a couple of ways. One, we have had people who are in drug court or who are on probation who are trying to convince you as the provider to give them ifavirenz because they wanna keep using marijuana and blame their positive cannabinoid test on this drug. Uh, but we also have people who have been in probation or drug court who have been on ifavirenz and have been at very real risk of losing their jobs or losing their houses because this um, urine test came up positive when they have stopped using the marijuana. So know your patients, know what they're looking for, know if they're trying to manipulate you, uh, but do know that this can happen. And a second urine test that's a different manufacturer tends to be enough to, uh, to show if it's true or not. Long-term use does cause hypertriglyceridemia. And um, one concern about this medication is that it should be taken on an empty stomach. Um, the concern is that whereas most of the time, if we increase absorption, that's good. It pushes it into the therapeutic range with food and ifavirenz, it pushes you out of the therapeutic range and into the toxic range. So you're gonna have much more likelihood of side effects related to the drug. Ropivirine initially was only for treatment naive patients until it was co-formulated with dolutegravir for those uh, patients who should uh, not be on three drugs. It should be taken with the biggest meal of the day, usually at least 500 kilocalories of, uh, of um, I guess calories. And, um, the one way that I tended to remember this when I was in uh, clinic was that we would do um, 493, which was about the, the size of an average um, large fry from McDonald's. And you can imagine that my nutritionists were not very fond of my using that example. They wanted things like, I don't know, avocado toast or peanut butter toast um, as healthy fats. Um, but either way, um, when you're talking about where a patient is and the types of foods that they can eat, oftentimes you'll find that those who are working um, a lot or who don't have the money to or the time to make home-cooked meals will often be using fast food. So I wasn't completely wrong, even though the nutritionist wanted me to think I was. Um, also, there is a concern that with higher viral loads or lower CD4 counts, there's a greater risk of failure with this drug. So be careful about checking for the viral load or CD4 count. Um, resistance to this medication causes resistance to all of the NRTIs except for doravirine. You have to use this one cautiously with QT, with QT prolongation because higher doses can actually induce QT prolongation. And this one, like adazanavir, does need acidity in the stomach to work, so be careful using it with H2 antagonists or proton pump inhibitors. Uh, this one has fewer adverse events than efavirenz. It doesn't cause issues with cholesterol, and you feel less drunk or high while using this medication, but it still can cause depression, insomnia, headache, and um, other symptoms as like. Another NNRTI is a travarine. Uh, this one has a pretty extensive resistance profile, and it's most commonly used for people who are resistant to other NNRTIs. Um, how do you know it's going to work? Uh, you take a look at all the mutations that a person has and you put them into these score scoring sheets that are listed here. Um, I would obviously never ask you to do this, but um, you're trying to find somebody who has as low a number as possible. And um, you can see that for people who have a score of greater than four, um, those people are resistant and shouldn't be using it at Traverine. Um, this one has to be taken with food to increase concentrations. And the one benefit to this one for people who are treatment experienced and are sick of taking pills 
is that you can actually mix this one with a little bit of water to make a slurry, and that will allow you to take your other pills with the slurry that you've made out of this drug. Um, it doesn't taste like anything. It tastes just like whatever it is that you're putting the slurry in. And I would recommend that you don't put it in colas or sodas or fruit juices, but um, teas and um, flavored waters are not a problem at all. And this one does have extensive drug interactions. So um, do be aware that if you are starting it on someone, you have to be careful of the other drugs they're taking. The last NNRTI that we're gonna talk about is Duravarine. Uh, this is found in a single tablet regimen with tenofovir to saproxyl fumarate and lamivudine, and it can be taken with or without food, which makes it different than the other NNRTIs that we talked about. Uh, limited adverse events in that there are fewer central nervous system effects than with rivivirine or ifavirenz, and it does have a more favorable lipid profile than ifavirenz. Um, there's also very few drug interactions, and there is no concern about using with acid reducers in the stomach. This one also has a very high genetic barrier to resistance, and what's nice about it is that whereas all the other ones, all the other NNRTIs tend to follow the same resistance patterns, this one has a unique pathway, so even if you are resistant to the older drugs, you can still use this medication. To choose an NNRTI, the ones that are most commonly used currently are efavirenz and rilpimarine. Uh, we do need to consider viral load and CD4 count. If it's too high a viral load or too low a CD4 count, rilpimarine doesn't always work. Consider the drug interactions, uh, consider food interactions or food requirements. Remember, if Avarin should be taken on an empty stomach, but real pimarine and atravarine should be taken with food. Um, consider adverse events as well. And like I said, um, atravarine is only really used for people who are heavily treatment experienced, but uh, nevirapine is also rarely used. It's still a great option, but it just, it never garnered favor with the people who write the drug uh, guidelines. So we don't see that one too much. So now we'll talk about the entry inhibitors, and in the videos, there is some information about how this whole process actually works. So I'm gonna skip this slide now. I do wanna make sure we talk about the three different options that are out there. Remember though that none of these drugs are indicated as first-line therapy in treatment-naive patients. So the first one is the CCR5 antagonist Maraviroc. Uh, the trophile has to be done immediately prior to use, and the trophile is going to tell you whether or not the um, co-receptor that allows for the virus to get into the cell is R5 tropic or X4. Most early viruses or most people who are newly diagnosed will have an R5 tropic virus, so they could use Marevroc, which is an antagonist, and block the entry of the, the virus into the cell. As you age or as your virus ages and you've been on more medications and you start to notice there's some failure, your virus automatically changes to an X4 trophic virus. And that virus is not going to be affected by Marevorac. You could give it all the Marevorac you want, but since it doesn't use R5 to get into the cell, it doesn't affect the entry into the cell and the, the virus can still get into the cell. Uh, dosing of this medication is gonna depend completely on the other drugs that are in the person's regimen, including drugs that are not HIV medications. And the reason this is the case is that this is a substrate of C3A. Um, Major side effects are flu-like symptoms and respiratory illness, generally very self-limiting. And the one interesting thing about this that I wanna make sure everybody's on the same page about is that um, the way that this drug came around is they were doing studies in other parts of the world where women were kind of forced into um, to being sex workers. And they were trying to figure out why some of these women were getting HIV and some of them weren't. And what they found is that the women who were more resistant to getting HIV or to coming down with HIV were ones that had a 32 base pair deletion in their CCR5 co-receptor. And um, even if they did get the disease or get the virus, what they found was that people who had this deletion were less likely to progress as quickly as people who um, did not have this deletion. So they made this drug and um, it's definitely got a great place in therapy. But another interesting component about this is that if you consider the Berlin and London patients, which we talked a little bit about last year, these are the two people in the world who have ever been cured of HIV. The reason they've been cured is that they had some form of cancer and they were, going, they were undergoing a stem cell transplant or a bone marrow transplant. Um, when they did the bone marrow transplant, the blood that they got or the, the transplant that they received was also 32 base pair deletion in their CCR5. And these people who were given a new chance at their immune system 
found that they actually didn't have HIV after their uh, their immune system rebounded. So it's an option. It's a great way to, it's great news for people who are looking for a cure, but are we going to be doing stem cell or bone marrow transplants in everybody? The answer is no, because it's expensive and you're wiping out their immune system. So there's a really good chance these people could have died before they saw the benefit that they did. Mareverock dosing is listed here. Uh, you can see that just with the HIV medications, those that are inhibitors or inducers um, will require different doses of Mareverock. But even with medications that are not HIV medications, things like um, statins, things like um, other drugs like anticonvulsants that could potentially impact the, um, the 3A, you're going to see that the doses should be changed for those as well. So this is a uh, most providers' nightmares, but it's job security for pharmacists. Another one is empuvertide. This is a drug that is reconstituted uh, before it is administered sub-Q twice a day. Uh, if you do put both doses together, and I will say it takes about 45 minutes for it to reconstitute completely, it's always wise to refrigerate it. So you, you are keeping it in the refrigerator until the next dose. Uh, this is only good in the refrigerator after it's been reconstituted for 24 hours. Um, mainly, this is used for heavily treatment experienced patients, and it is very effective, but it's very difficult for people to take long term. Um, one of the concerns is that it does cause pretty um, severe injection site reactions, and it can also cause flu-like symptoms. So you can imagine in a situation like this, we're not going to be giving it to somebody who is homeless, somebody who's had their electric cut off, um, somebody who does not have the time or the, for, the forward thinking to, to reconstitute it in the time that it takes. Um, this is a, it's a difficult one to take. Where do you inject it? You inject it in the same places you would insulin, in the back of your arm, uh, your upper thigh, or on the sides of your abdomen. And the last drug that's available in this class is ibilizumab, which is a broadly neutralizing antibody. Um, typically, this is only used for heavily treatment experienced patients who are multi-class resistant. I will say that in my time working as a clinician, I have never seen this one used, thankfully. But for people who have failed everything and failed the kitchen sink, this is an option for people who, uh, who need something to work. Um, typically speaking, the dose is given um, IV every 14 days, and adverse events are diarrhea, nausea, rash, and dizziness. And because of the way that it works, there are no expected drug-drug interactions. So when do you use these other drugs? Uh, currently, none of them are recommended as first line. There still may be a place for Merevrock if you think about how it works. Um, but that drug is still going to be twice daily, and there is no single tablet regimen that contains Merevrock. So there's no, no real need to use it um, up front. The other concern about Merevrock is that because it is impacting um, the CCR5, other cells might potentially have CCR5 that are not the HIV infected cells, and we don't know what blocking CCR5 does in the rest of the body. So there is some potential that that uh, could be a reason to stay away from that drug. But do you know that medicine is not cookie cutter and it's not one size fits all. So you always have to consider the patient specific factors, always consider their needs, always consider their lifestyle and how you can fit these medications into them. And um, if treatment resistance or concerns about side effects do exist, there may be a role for these drugs, even in people who are um, first or second line. And the other question that's going to come up just because it comes up every year is, well, how do you keep this all straight? Or how am I expected to know all of this? And I will say that the only way that people keep this straight is just like the only way they keep working in oncology straight or working with diabetes straight. You have to do it every day. And um, I don't expect that any of you are going to be able to do this every day. So I will, like I said, give you a couple of hints um, in terms of like a, a cheat sheet. Um, but if this is something that fascinates you and you start to see it every day, it will come to you. And uh, I think most people know more than they think they do. And even you as pharmacy students know more than you think you do. So, uh, so hang in there and uh, you know, you're almost done.